Father Callaway, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, uh, to do this presentation with us. We are here in the house of Mary Macklet in San Agustin, Florida, and we have connected the house in Alabama, Santa Maria Goretti, the girls' house that we have here also, and we are connecting the next house that is Our Lady of Hope. So pretty much you're gonna have the whole community in front of you, you know, listen to you. And we are very happy and we are really welcome you to to do to present this uh, your book or, or, or the consecration of saint joseph and we as a community we are very devoted to saint joseph and every time we say the rosary we always end the rosary with saint joseph thank you and provide for us saint joseph saint joseph for us is uh, divine providence saint joseph for us is also an example of trusting you know an example of men that uh, you know a saint that really for us that we really uh, you know follow in any ways you know and this is the year of saint joseph so more and more is a year that we even entrust our community to saint joseph so i let you and uh, to speak and also holy spirit will lead you and he will lead us in questions after that and okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. So let's begin with a prayer, okay? It's okay. So um, in the book, if you have the book, it's, um, it's in the back. It's on page 245. But if you don't, no worries. I'll, I'll lead it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Prayer to St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. Cast your solemn gaze upon the devil and his minions and protect us with your mighty staff. You fled through the night to avoid the devil's wicked designs. Now with the power of God, smite the demons as they flee from you. Grant special protection, we pray, for children, fathers, families, and the dying. By God's grace, no demon dares approach while you are near. So we beg of you, always be near to us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, my friends, well, thank you so much. This is a great blessing for me because um, I've known about Chinakalo for a long time, long time. And the last time that I was in Medjugorje, which was a long time ago, I gave my testimony there uh, to the people who were at, there at the time. And I've had several friends who have gone through Chinakalo, and it changed their life. Um, so what I'm going to share with you um, today is are two things, basically. Um, first is my own story, because, um, you know, I, I had a lot of problems myself. So I want to give you kind of some hope um, and a message of God's love and his mercy for you. Um, and then I want to transition into the consecration to St. Joseph and the year of St. Joseph and why this is so important right now. Um, I think you'll get a lot out of that. So I didn't know that a lot of people in Chinakalo may not know my story. I thought, well, Chinakalo probably, the, all of them probably know my story because I should have been in Chinakalo. I should probably still be there because <laughs> I'm a man in process, right? I'm a, I'm a man who's undergoing a conversion every day. So for those of you who don't know my story, I'll just give it to you briefly, briefly. So when I was born, right, um, my parents were not religious. They were not Catholic. They were not Protestant. They were not Buddhist. They were not Muslims. They were nothing. They didn't believe in God. And I lived a very tumultuous life, you know, in, growing up. And my mother, um, she had a lot of problems. And she married three times before I was 10 years old, I had three fathers. And it was for me, the consequences of that were, were really bad, because I looked to, you know, male figures, longing for a father, longing for somebody to 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 treat me with with love and 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 tenderness and, and to be a model for me, but I didn't find it. So I looked in the world, and I found it in the world. But they were all the flawed models, they were all the ones who were really messed up but I followed that. So as I got into my preteen years, you know, I started doing drugs. I started 
looking at pornography, uh, doing drugs, all of that crazy stuff. And then we, as a family, we moved to California, which for me was paradise. I loved it. It was fantastic. But things got worse, radically worse. And then we moved again to Japan because my third father was a military officer. So when we moved to Japan, I went into complete rebellion against all authority, any kind of institution. And I stopped going to school. I ran away from home in Japan on the big island of Honshu. That's the big one in the middle. And I got involved with the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia. And I was selling drugs for them. And it was absolutely insane. And I caused an international scene with the crazy stuff that I was doing. It was, it was unbelievable. But, but through all of that craziness, my mother, who is very Italian, my mother's uh, name is Lecita Bianco. So how my mother was not a Catholic is very strange, very weird, right? But she wasn't. Obviously, in our history, in our family history, we were Catholic. But when my immigrant family members came over from Italy to the United States, they didn't continue the faith. Um, and so it didn't, we didn't have it. Well, my mom in Japan, she was having so many crises. She was on medication for depression, anxiety, for stress, for everything. She was going to a counselor, a psychologist. None of it was working. None of it was working until there was a lady in Japan. And this is amazing because I, I know you probably know this, but I'll say it anyway, because it's so true. There was a lady in Japan who told my mother this, okay? And this lady was a Catholic Filipino woman, okay? Let me tell you something, my friends. Don't mess with the Catholic Filipino woman. They are the special forces of God. They are the green berets of the spiritual life. They will take you down, right? These, these women mean business. So this woman said to my mother, I know what you got to do. You have to go to a Catholic priest. And my mom was like, why? <laughs> I'm not going to go to talk to a Catholic priest. What are you talking about? But the, the Filipino woman, she didn't quit. She said, no, you got to talk to him. Talk to him, right? So my mom was like, fine, whatever. So my mom went reluctantly, and she talked to a Catholic priest, a military chaplain. And that priest changed my mom's life. Because I don't know. It was almost like Catholicism was dormant in her Italian DNA. And he just went like on, <laughs> he turned it on. And she was like, this is amazing because he was telling my mom about Catholicism, hardcore in your face Catholicism. And he told my mom about the Eucharist, about where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. My mom had never heard this. But she had been going to counseling in all these places where they were giving her medication. So she was consuming a lot of stuff, but it wasn't giving her life. And all of a sudden, this priest is telling her about this, you know, Eucharist. And she's like, I've never heard this. He told her about confession. Basically, the greatest counseling in psychology, psychotherapy known to man. And it's free. It's free. You don't have to pay a dime to get this, right? So my mom was like, what is this? I mean, I've been spending so much money trying to help you. And the priest was like, well, yeah, okay. But what I'm telling you is this is free. you know. And technically you could go every day if you need it. And my mom was like, what? So he told her about the Virgin Mary. He told her about this one particular saint uh, who was a nasty sinner, horrible man named Augustine, right? And his mother, who was just, oh, such a pious woman. And Augustine made fun of her, mocked his mother's religion. And when she tried to teach him about Jesus, he was like, no, that's for the weak people. I, you know, have been educated. I know about the stars and I know about this. No, you were a player, Augustine. <laughs> you were a player, homie. You didn't want to change your life. And so you didn't, you know, listen to your mother and you mocked her. And how bad did it get? This is what the priest told my mom. It got so bad that he, to get away from his mother, left the country. See this, my mom was identifying with this because of the situation. We were in a different country and the problems I was causing. He said that they lived in Northern Africa and he was so sick and tired of his mother talking to him about Jesus that he left and went to Italy, right? 
wrong boat, bro. <laughs> you just went to the heart of Christianity, right? You, 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 that ain't going to work. So sure enough, when he was in Milan, you know, one day he heard beautiful music coming out of a beautiful building and he goes in and he hears this guy preaching and he hears these words, tole et lege, means take and read, meaning the Bible. And that man's life was changed and he became a great saint, a great saint. And so when my mom heard this and, and this priest told my mother that her suffering was no longer wasted before she was just like, this is pointless. Everything I'm going through is pointless. The priest said, you can give your suffering to Jesus, just like this Monica did for her son, who was a sinner, a great sinner. And so my mom was like, wow, I'm in, you know, and, and, uh, and there was a process, of course, but I didn't know this. I was running, I was doing my own thing on the streets of Tokyo and Yokohama. It was nuts. So she started to become Catholic with my father. And when I say father now, I mean my third father and my half brother. But it didn't work because they had to leave the country, my mom and my brother. And I didn't even know that they no longer lived in Japan. I was still there. And my father, because he stayed to look for me with the authorities. Well, eventually they caught me. They apprehended me. They threw me in jail. I ran away. They threw me in the brig. I ran away. But they caught me. They handcuffed me to the plane to two military police officers and kicked me out of the country. I came back to the United States and I went to my first rehabilitation center. It was in Pennsylvania and it's still there. Um, it's called New, New Beginnings at Cove Forge. It's in Altoona, Pennsylvania, way out in the woods. It didn't help. I got worse. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a terrible experience, to be honest with you, because I was, you know, I learned how to do more drugs in the rehab and I was there for three months and I didn't get better. I got worse. So when I came back to my parents after that three months, my mom said to me, we've become Catholic. Your father and I have become Catholic. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, you've joined a cult. Wonderful. You know, I'm supposed to celebrate this. You know, I thought Catholicism was a cult. I thought these were people that were going to like move to Uganda and drink Kool-Aid and off themselves to follow little green men throughout the cosmos. You know, that's what Catholicism meant to me. I had no understanding of what this was. Then she said to me, come to church with us. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're a Christian? Because I didn't even know a Catholic was a Christian. And she said, yes. And she, she said, come to church with us. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. I'm like, no way. I can't believe you've been suckered and duped into believing that nonsense. That's fairy tales. That's cartoons, man. I mean, come on. And I couldn't stay in their house because my parents were so religious that every time they ate a cracker, they stopped and bless us, oh Lord. And I'm like, what's up with you people? I mean, it freaked me out. I couldn't even st be, stand to be around them. So I left. And this is what I look like at this point, okay? Now, I'm not a narcissist. I'm working on my pride, but I do carry a big picture of myself all around the world. So this is what I look like at that point, okay? That was me. Yeah. So that, that was when I was 17 years old and had just you know, gotten out of my first rehab. And my hair in this picture is short. When, it was, when I was 20, it was all the way down to my belt. And just crazy, crazy. So I left. I followed a band called The Grateful Dead on a Volkswagen bus. I'm doing acid, mushrooms, uppers, downers, you know, crack, hair, everything. You name, you name it. Every day, right? And so then I, um, I woke up on the streets of Philadelphia because I OD'd on crack. And I was put into another rehab, a lockdown pad of facility, which was also a psychiatric institute in Philadelphia. It's called uh, Charter Fairmont Institute, it's still there. I was there for three months. I didn't get better, I got worse uh, because it was a Band-Aid on a spiritual problem, right? They just wanted to make sure that I went to my meetings and got my chip and cooperated with the program and took my medicine. But there was nothing in it about religion or nothing about the gospel or about sin or about conversion. No, that talk was... Not at all. Never did I hear that kind of talk. I wish I had known about Chinakolo at the time, really. I mean, that, that would have done me a world of good, but I didn't. Um, and so when I got out of that one, I go back to my parents' house, and guess what they're doing now? <laughs> my mom and dad are going to church every day. Every day. Before, they were going on Sundays. Now they're going every day, and I'm like, my parents, they're lunatics. I'm sorry. I'm like apologizing to the world. I'm like, who does this? This is crazy man behavior, going to church every day. But they were different. My mom was so nice. 
like before she was an Italian mother. Like when I came home, she'd be like, Donnie, whoo, she smacked me upside my head. You know, now she's just like so nice. She's like, I love you. And Jesus loves you. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, shoot me. I couldn't stand it, but I, I could not deny that she was totally different, but I didn't chalk that up to her being in love with Jesus. I just thought she's weird. So I left again. I got thrown in jail when I turned 18 in Louisiana because I wasn't 18 yet, right? Got thrown in jail at 18 years old. Didn't go to my court date. So now I'm wanted in Louisiana. So I, I'm wandering a nomad, going nowhere. And then on one occasion, I'm back at my parents' house. And I didn't want to live anymore. I wanted to take my own life. I didn't even want to be here anymore because I had dropped out of school. I had no desire, ambitions, career options, or, you know, meant nothing to me. Um, and as I'm sitting in my parents' house that night, I, I, I got bored. I was just like, I don't know what to do. My friends are probably wasted on a beach. I done messed it up. I'm like, uh, so I went out to the hallway to look at National Geographics, which are yellow, right? So I went out there and I'm, I'm looking for a National Geographic and I don't see any, but I find this one book that's yellow, the binding, and it says this, okay? This is what I saw. It said, the queen of peace visits Meju Juji Gor G G G Gor, right? What the heck is that? I have no idea what that is. So I pull it out and all I see is some babushka looking lady barefoot on like the most extremely rocky mountain I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, put some shoes on grandma. What's up? What is up with this? And, but there was a cross on the cover. So to me, that was Christian. So I'm like, ah, ha ha. This is like the dork manual that my parents got suckered into following some preacher. And I bet you they didn't want me to find this. They call me weird. Ha. So I was like, I want to see what they're into. So I go into the room and I start to read the book, but it's talking about places I can't even pronounce. I'm like, give me a vow. You know, it's like all consonants. And I'm just like, what is this? Talking about some war. I'm not interested. So I look in the middle at some pictures and there's these little children and they're looking into the air like they had just toked up a fat one. They were like, hey, you know, they look, I'm like, what is this? Right. And so I, I didn't know what to make of this. I'm like, okay, what are they looking at? So then below the pictures were writings and it said, the little children are now seeing the Blessed Virgin Mary. Whatever. I don't know what a Blessed Virgin Mary is, right? And then one of the girl's names, I thought her name was marijuana because it looked like marijuana, Right. I did. I really did. And the funny thing is, is I've met her several times now. And I told her, I said, you know, I thought your name was marijuana. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I was like, I don't even, what is this? So I start reading it again. And I'm just blown away by what I'm reading. Because they're saying that some beautiful woman comes with like a clap of thunder and, you know, like heavenly doves and the smell of roses. And I'm just like, what? And she starts to talk to them. That's what they were saying. And it, this stuff was in quotes. And she's saying, I've come to tell you that God exists. And I'm like, oh, no, no. I'm like, come on, don't go down that route. I was all into you because you. they said you're beautiful. And, you know, that's a, I'm a dude, right? So I'm like, that's interesting to me. But this whole God thing, mm, not going to fly. But I couldn't put the book down. And then she started talking about Jesus. She said that she was the mother of Jesus. And I'm like, the mother of Jesus? I'm like, you know, that he doesn't have a mom, like Scooby-Doo ain't got a mom, you know, Tom and Jerry ain't got a mom. What are you talking about? Jesus got a mom. What do you, what is this? You know, to me, Christianity was, it wasn't real because when I grew up, right, I would watch cartoons on a Saturday and Sunday morning. And in between the cartoons, I would flip channels and see some preacher man talking about be healed in the name of Jesus. That was what I saw about Christianity, right? And he would be talking about some dude who walked on water and came back from the dead. But that was between cartoons. So I'm like, I would also see some coyote dying like nine times an episode by some bird, you know, that killed him. And I'm like, that's like, none of that stuff is real. If you're an adult and you believe that there's a fat man who comes down your chimney and eats your cookies and drinks your milk, or there's a, a, a bunny rabbit that, you know, pops out golden eggs, you need help. Okay, if you're an adult and you believe that, you need some serious medication. And if you're an adult and you think somebody walks on water and came out from the dead, you're just hard up for cash, homie. You're just trying to get a real job. That's what I thought, right? So I'm like, what are you talking about? You're the mother of Jesus. I can be the mother of a fairy tale. But I couldn't stop reading. 
I read the whole book in one night. The whole thing. I didn't go to sleep. And I knew it was true. I knew it was true. I didn't understand most of it because it was Catholic. But when my mom got up in the morning, she, we met like halfway on the stair, staircase. And I tried to tell her this. I, I tried to tell her I needed to, mom, I got to talk to a, I couldn't even say it. Because to show a churchy need to my mother was like the ultimate death, right? So she's like half asleep. She's like, what? And I said, mom, I got to talk to a Catholic priest. And you know what she said to me? We joke about this to this day. She looks at me and she goes, yeah, right. <laughs> That's what she said to me. And I'm like, mama, I'm ser- I got the book. And I said, what the heck is this? And she said, did you read that? Uh-huh. And she ran right to the phone, tried to call some dude. And he was like, no, come over at nine. And she's, he, she's like, no, father, father, please, please. And she tried another one. It didn't work. So I said, mom, isn't there one of those things, right? And it was a church. And she said, yes, run. And so I ran, I mean, funkified, like you've never seen. You could have got a contact high if you stood close enough to me. I mean, I looked horrible at that point in my life. I mean, I was so gone. I mean, I had done so much acid and mushrooms that I, I did talk to turtles, man. You don't even know, right? It was insane, the life that I lived, right? So all of a sudden, here I am running across this military installation, long hair flying in the wind. I get to the chapel, and the name of it is Our Lady of Victory. But I don't, I don't do church. I'm not going in there, right? So I go to another building that says chaplain's office, and I yell out, Catholic priest. Because in that book, this Virgin Mary said that if you want peace, you have to go to a Catholic priest and confess your sins. So I'm like, hook me up. you know. So I yelled out, Catholic priest. All these heads are popping out of cubicles. Nobody wants to approach the long-haired freak in the hallway, me. And so I'm like, hello, I can see you. Somebody help me. And so finally, somebody comes to, towards me, and they said, "What do you? What? Who are you?" And I'm like, "You ain't got to worry about that." I'm like, "Give me a Catholic priest." So some other dude comes with a navy uniform on, just like everybody else, because I don't know what a Catholic priest is supposed to look like. But in my TV mind, I'm thinking like Moses. You know, I want Moses. Where's Moses? You know. So this dude didn't look like Moses. He looked like a military officer. You know, yes, sir. So he comes over, and he says, "Can I help you?" And I'm like um, are you like a preacher? Are you, you do God stuff? And he's like, "Mm, yeah. And I'm like, okay, that didn't give me a lot of confidence. So I was like, all right, bro, get it, get it out of me, get it out. And he's looking at me like, I don't, what do you get? What out? And I'm like, I don't know, bro. But in that book, I'm freaking out, man, because that I've never read something like that. That woman freaking me out, bro. And he goes, well, what do you want me to do? And I go, I don't know. She said, I got to go to confession. So he goes, oh, great. You know, so we go to his little cubicle and he was scared. I mean, he was, he pulled his chair like halfway out into the hallway, you know, in case maybe I tried to stab him or something, you know, he was scared, man. So I put my head down and I started telling that man sinful stuff, I guess. I wasn't sure exactly what a sin was, but I had done a lot of things in life that I was not proud of and hurting people and terrible things. So I'm telling him this stuff, but he's not talking back to me. And I'm looking at the rug because I'm so embarrassed by what I'm telling him. I look up at one point and he was like, you did what? And I was like, oh yeah, you know? And he's like, okay, hold on, wait a minute. He goes, when's the last time you went to confession? And I'm like, <laughs> bro, I don't know. And he goes, okay, was it in high school? And I'm like, no, I dropped out of high school. He's like, okay, well, how about, and I'm like, no. And I go, he goes, oh, well, you're a Catholic, right? And I'm like, heck no. <laughs> and he goes, what? He goes, you can't, this is a sacrament. He go, He got upset and rightly so. And I'm like, bro, I don't know your rules. I said, all I know is that woman. And he goes, what woman? And I said, a virgin, bro, there's a virgin, right? I didn't know no virgins. And this one's coming from like, you know, and I'm like, this is like, I'm like, do you, do you know this stuff? And he's like, uh, is it the mother of Jesus? And I'm like, yeah, that's the one. And I'm like, bro, I didn't even know she had a mom. You, you know this? And he's like, yeah. So I'm like, uh, this is all new to me. So he goes, look, I've got to go celebrate mass. Now I'm not a Catholic. I am ignorant as all get out. So that man just told me that he's going to go rejoice and, and celebrate neutrons and protons. You know, he's going to celebrate gravity, man. Gra- celebrate mass, man. You know, I don't know what that dude is trying to tell me. So I'm like, You're, what? And he goes, celebrate mass. And I'm like, I don't I don't know what that is. And he goes, okay, all right. 
did you see the building where the chapel is? I said, yep. He goes, go over there and go in. I'm going to be over there in a little bit. And when I'm done, we'll meet back here. Okay. And I'm like, all right. So when I walk away, he goes, but do me a favor. When you go in, sit in the back. Okay. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And I'm like, okay, I get it. So I go over there. I, I open the door and the door slams behind me. Guess who's in that church? In the front pew. Nobody else in that entire church, but right next to the door in the front pew where I walked in, five Filipino women. Five of them, right? I'm dead meat, man. I'm toast. I the, One of these women took down my family, right? So I'm like, uh-uh. So I, you couldn't get me to the back fast enough. I mean, I like ran to the back of the church. I sit down and all of a sudden, this leader because I've been to the Philippines many, many times, and I know Filipino culture, like it's a very matriarchal culture. So there she is, self-appointed matriarch, telling everybody else what to do. She goes up and fires up a couple candles on this table, and then she goes back and she pulls out some necklace from her purse, and she signals to the other ones, you know, and then she starts this like Tagalog incantation to the ceiling, <laughs> you know? Uh, really, I mean, that's what white boy me in the back heard. And if any of you are Filipino, Please don't think I'm making fun of you when I do this, because I'm not. Salamat po to you and your people. I love you, okay? But this is what white boy in the back heard. Hey, You know, like, what the heck is that, right? And then the other four reciprocated together, like, holy, amen. And it was like, you know, it was like machine gun fire. And I'm like, I'm clueless. I'm literally thinking that they have started some kind of Wiccan coven up in here. And that priest better get in here quick because this is not good. This is not good. Right? We got a situation. And then this woman, the leader, she turns around with her necklace, holds it up and jingles it to me, the freak in the back. And she goes, young man, would you like to pray the next decade, please? Next decade. Right. <laughs> I'm like a deer in headlights. I'm like, what? So she goes, the second side of for me study, second side of for me study. I have no idea what this woman is trying to tell me, right? Because a decade to me means 10 years. It don't mean nothing else, you know? So I'm just looking at her like, whatever, you know? I'm thinking, you're going down, sister, when that priest comes in, because you probably don't know he's coming in here, you know? And so they carried on with this thing. I didn't know what it was. Obviously, it was a rosary. Then they stop, and he comes in. And he's dressed different now. Now he looks like a hippie. He's got a robe on with a flower on the front. I'm like, yo, what up? <laughs> and he's cool with them. He's like, morning, you know, and I'm like, oh. part of me wanted to tell him like, bro, bro, you know, <laughs> and so then he goes up there and he starts doing all kinds of stuff. And I don't understand it. And then at one point, he bends over on that uh, table, which was an altar, picks up a little white circle about that big. And he and he and he says this, okay, I heard this with my own ears. I have never heard something so radical in my life. The man said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. And he held it up. And I'm like, you're a lunatic, bro. I'm like, what? I'm like, that man just told us that that's his body and we got to eat it. That's what I heard. And I'm like, you need some help, man. What? And he just held, he was like showcasing it. He was like, -da, you know, just standing there with it. And it was as though somebody came into the room and pressed pause at that moment. He just stood there. And I heard a voice. Now, I'm not a locutionist. I don't get apparitions, but I heard a voice. And the voice said to me, to me, not to my ear, worship. And you know what happened next? Uh, this is the only way that I can describe this to people. And I've been talking about this now for 25 years. It was like I got injected with knowledge. I knew what that man had in his hands was God. I didn't know terminology, Eucharist, Blessed Sacrament, Holy Communion, clueless about that kind of stuff. But I knew it was God. I knew it. He put down God. He picked up a really sweet looking medieval cup, right? I didn't know what it was. And he said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is my blood. And he held it up. Same thing happened. I heard a voice, worship. And then I knew. I knew what that man had was God. He put down God. Then the women got up. He got up. And they met like halfway. And I saw that dude say to each one of those women, one by one, the body of Christ. And he, I saw that man put God inside them. I saw this. 
And the man did not say, my body, my body, right? What the voice told me was true. And then he got up, got the cup, the chalice. He came down and he said, the blood of Christ. That's exactly what I knew. I knew it was, right? So when that happened, I was tripping. I mean, I was like, I've either, I'm either losing my mind or this is, I'm never going to be the same. Something radical is going down right here. And then he put what seemed to be God still in a gold box with a little red light next to it. And he left. And then they left. And there I was alone with God in a box, right? The tabernacle, but I didn't know the language. So then I go over to his office and I'm like tripping. I'm like, bro, holy moly. I'm like, you made God, dude. Did you hear it? Did you hear it? And he's like, mm, no. And I'm like, bro, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. So he goes, look, I don't know what to do either. <laughs> he goes, you need to go home. So I'm going to give you some stuff. Go home. Come back tomorrow. So he gave me a crucifix, a painting of Jesus, and a picture of his grandpa. Kind of random, right? So I'm like, whatever. So I go back to the house, and I, I took down my big old Bob Marley poster smoking a big old blunt, right? I was like, you got to go. And Jerry Garcia got to go. And all this stuff got to go. And I hung up Jesus, Jesus, and grandpa, you know? Now, who's this grandpa dude? Well, it looked like a dude who had eaten one too many cookies. He was a little chubby looking fellow with a weird little white hat, you know? So I was like, I don't know. It was John Paul too, but I didn't know that. Okay. I just thought this dude gave me a picture of his grandpa. So I was like, okay. So I went through that day, what I call divine detox. What the secular rehabs couldn't do for me, God was going to do in a radical way. And all he wanted from me was for me to get on my knees and desire him and acknowledge that I was a sinner. And my friends, some transformation unbelievable happened to me that day i got on my knees and i was trying to look at this image this painting of jesus and i lost it because i'm looking at the painting thinking to myself you're god i mean not the painting i'm not a moron right you're not you're not a painting but i was like you exist man you're like real you know everything and you you want me because i expected the image of jesus to be looking at me like yeah, you little filthy perv. I'm going to put you in a lake of fire, right? You suck. That's what I thought because I did. So I, I didn't expect him to be like this with a gesture of blessing and a heart on fire and the eyes like wanting me. I lost it. I started to cry like a human being can't cry. It was a gift. I cried all day on my knees. I had so much liquid coming out of my face. I don't even know the body has that much fluid. It was pouring out of my face all day. And my mom testifies to this because she was in the house and she didn't bother me. She let me in there and she heard me just wailing, just weeping. And it lasted all day. And then when I, I got up from that, um, I went to lay down to, you know, not mess anything up and go back to the priest. But then something else happened. Now, this is hard to explain and scary because guess who came into the room? Satan. I didn't believe in Satan. I didn't. I was like, that's like fairy tale stuff. You know, boo, that's, we all entertain ourselves with this stuff, man. This is like, we dress our kids up like witches and goblins and demons and send them to the neighbors to get candy, right? Good times in America, right? So I was like, this devil stuff ain't, this is, no. All of a sudden, the devil was starting to manifest himself in my room and trying to take me in my soul. I wasn't a Satanist. I never went to some pentagram service, slashed a chicken's throat and, you know, rambled on and some kind of foreign stuff. I never did anything like that. But I used to dabble in, you know, Ouija boards and tarot cards, not because I wanted to. I was just trying to score a chick, you know, at these seances or whatever. You know, I'm like, I'd be the one moving the cards, like hook up with me. Oh, wow. You know, or whatever it would be. So I, I didn't believe in it. But that don't mean it's not real. Right. Just like you're all breathing air right now. If you say that there's no air just because you can't see it, <laughs> you're crazy. Right. Well, I was crazy because I, I didn't believe in it, but I was running with it as the music says, running with the devil, right? I really was. And so he came back to try and take me, really. And I was terrified. I was so terrified because what am I going to do to a creature that's starting to manifest itself, literally appearing to me? What am I going to take a punch at the devil? What's this going to do? Made from dust to a fallen angel, Lucifer, nothing. So I did what I could. From my soul, I screamed out. I screamed out, Mary! Because she brought me to Jesus. And I'm telling you, the devil was like annihilated. I mean, obliterated. And I had the most amazing peace come over me.
that I've never had since. I, I mean, it, just unbelievable piece. And then I heard another voice. Again, I'm not a locutionist. It was a one-time thing. I heard a woman's voice, the most pure, feminine, motherly voice, like liquid love trickling over my soul. And it said to me, Donnie, I'm so happy. Nobody calls me Donnie, but my mom, nobody, right? So who is this? My mom's in the house doing whatever. I knew who it was. It was the mother of Jesus Christ. And by telling, calling me Donnie, she's telling me that she's my mother. I slept that night like a little baby tucked up against his mother's breast. Not even the devil could touch me because I was near Mary. I went to that priest the next day, told him what happened, freaked that dude out. He was tripping. And I'm like, bro, I know, I know, I know. But I'm telling you, it went down yesterday, man. It went down, right? And I said, sign me up. He's like, sign, for what? And I'm like, Catholic. I want to be a Catholic. And you know what he said to me? No. <laughs> I didn't expect that. I thought he'd be like, saved a soul. Yay, right? Got one. Got my quota. And I was like, what do you mean no? And he goes, well, it's not like you signed a piece of paper and you're a Catholic. There's a process. You got to go to classes. They're once a week for you know, about five, six months. This is the archdiocese, the military services. So I was like, oh man, I'm like, you serious? He's like, yeah, that's the way it's done. I'm like, fine. When is, he goes, next one's Tuesday. And I'm like, all right, I'll be there. My whole life changed. I was in love. All my friends left me, all of them. I became a dork. I did. I cut my hair and I lost all my power. I did. I got normal human being clothes. I stopped my, my language. I got a job. All my friends left me. Not one stayed with me. And that hurt. That hurt. But I was in love. And all I did during before I went to work for my lunch break and after work was I went to church. And I wasn't receiving communion because I wasn't Catholic yet. But I just was in love. I mean, before long, I realized those Filipino women were like saints and they were praying this rosary. They weren't witches in a coven, right? These are holy people. And they taught me how to pray this thing. And before long, I was leading the decades. And I, was, I would do Stations of the Cross like NASCAR. You know, I would just keep lapping that sucker until I passed out. Nobody told me you did it once. <laughs> you know? I was like so zealous. I had no idea how to do these things, but I was, it was going to be done. And then one of these women introduced me to St. Joseph, to St. Joseph. She said, she kind of gave me a tour and she said, you know, these are, you know, the, the saint in the window and this stained glass. And this is St. Joseph, right? The statue here. And she's like, he can really help you. And I'm like, yeah, I think so. Because I think I really need like a good father and a good man to, to, to help me repair the damage. And so that began my initial relationship with St. Joseph, where I would go to him every day, kneel before that statue and ask him and beg him, please. Help me, because I have royally jacked it up, okay? I have hurt so many people, so many girls, myself, so many people I have done so many bad things to. I, 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 I need you. I mean, you were good enough. If God said that you would, like, be the stand-in father for the, the Messiah, for Jesus, I mean, I think I, I, I need you, because I am warped. I am really deformed in my whole being. My intentions sometimes are so bad. My, my desires, my eyes, I can't, I can't even focus on pure things because I am jacked up. Help me. And he did. And he taught me that power of the interior life and, and, and the power of, uh, you know, penance and, and, and a mortified life and the fasting, all the fasting. Oh, my gracious. You guys know this, right? I'm talking to the choir here. But that whole thing of fasting on bread and water on Wednesdays and Fridays for me was therapy, man. It was therapy. I was getting the poison out of my system and praying the rosary every day, which I did. I was getting rid of all those filthy images that I'd looked at for years, right? Now I was replacing them with holy images. And it was therapeutic. It was healing. And spending time before the tabernacle was like just, just like a generator just coming at me with purifying power. And in the evenings, I kid you not, like they would close the door to the church and I was like a teenager in love. I was like, I'd be looking through the window and you know how teenagers get, right? You no, know, you, know, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up, right? I was like, I didn't want to hang up. I would say to the tabernacle, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. And I was madly in love. I would be at church in the morning before work, before the Filipinos, man. I mean, that's crazy behavior for a white boy because I was in love, right? 
madly in love. And that's when, you know, I ended up becoming Catholic, which was the greatest day of my life. And then I discerned after that, that God was calling me to be a priest. Now, that was not easy because a lot of people, when I talked to them and told them my story, they were like, cool, praise God, but uh, not so sure about priesthood. So I'm like, I get it. <laughs> Trust me, I get it, right? I got a whole litany of indiscretions in my past that probably would prevent me from doing something like this. But the community that I looked into was the community that promotes divine mercy. And so I'm like, hello, poster child for this. you know. Um, so they were reluctant, but they said, well, we'll let you enter, but it may work, it may not. And um, it was tough. It was not easy because I had to study for 10 years because I had dropped out of school, the whole thing. And throughout that whole process, St. Joseph was helping me, really. I mean, in incredible ways, um, where every day, especially after Mass, after having received Holy Communion, after the final blessing, I would go before the statue and I would just ask him, help me. Because, I mean, I'm a work in progress. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I mean, the, the honeymoon with God and that conversion experience was mm, delicious, right? But like any marriage, that honeymoon lasts about two weeks, or, you know, in this instance, it lasted longer than that spiritually, but it's on with the sacrifice, on with the commitment and the fidelity, even when it doesn't feel good. And it started not to feel good. You know, God had basically in my conversion stuck a lollipop in my mouth and was like, it's good, huh? And I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah. And he's like, all right, I'm going to take it away because I don't want you to be a sucker. Okay. I want you to learn how to love. I want you to, to be a saint. I want you to be holy. And I want you to love me, not for the good feelings that I'm giving you, but for who I am, because I'm going to march you towards Calvary. And I was like, I'm in. I'm in. I love you. You saved my life. I mean, you've, you've unveiled for me the meaning of all things. And I'm in. And I mean, it's just been unbelievable, my friends. Do I fall? Do I make mistakes? Oh, yeah, right? Without confession, I'd be, I'd be so lost. But I know God loves me. I know there's truth. I know that I've been romanced by, by the lover of my soul, that all of this is true, that, you know, Catholicism is, 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 is real. And it's the fullness of it, the fullness of the message of Jesus. And it's not just a bunch of rules and regulations that inhibit your freedom, but it's the pathway to paradise, man. I knew this. I know this. And so now, having been a priest for 18 years now, about four years ago, I had so many people coming up to me, so many, on a daily basis, saying, Father, my marriage is on the rocks. My husband is cheating on me. My children hate me, hate the church. They're into all kind of weird stuff. One's shacked up with a significant other in San Francisco, this, that, and the other. I heard everything. And I'm like, wow, how do I help these people? I mean, what do I give them? Um, and then in prayer, you know, I was reminded of what a great saint had done and the effect that it had done on people when he came up with a 33-day program of consecration to Our Lady, St. Louis de Montfort. And I mean, popes have been influenced by that in tremendous ways. So I was like, and I did that shortly after the Filipino women, you know, gave me that. And it was just life-changing stuff. So I was like, almost every instance that I'm hearing these people come to me, there's a father issue. There's a father issue that they didn't have a good father or there's a father wound or they were girls were so insecure because their father wasn't tender with them. He wasn't present to them. He criticized them, said, why aren't you pretty like your sister or whatever it was so much involved with the father boys. The father was either too strong, right? Wanting to be the star to get the trophy or the father was a player and they saw him playing with other women besides the boy's mom. And it was horrible. And then I discovered things like today, 52% of all marriages end in divorce today, more than half. Um, one fourth, so 25% of all children today in America um, do not have a father, do not grow up with a father. This is the facts. And so I was like, we need, we need a father right now because so many people have never experienced a good, loving, sacrificial man who's a father in their life. I had three fathers in my life and none of them were St. Joseph. And so I was like, I think we need something like what St. Louis de Montfort did, but for St. Joseph. Not to be a competition. Everybody knows Mary's greater than St. Joseph, for sure. But let's look at Jesus here. I mean, he entrusted himself 
to Mary and Joseph, right? I think we need to do that. I'm like, in this time of crisis with families and marriage and all this confusion in the world today, I think the time has come. And so I set out basically on a quest to gather everything I could about St. Joseph worldwide. I traveled for three years, gathering information in obscure convents in Croatia, in Poland, down in South America, in the Philippines, in Malta. And I gathered everything you could possibly imagine on St. Joseph. And I came to know him in a deeper way. I knew him through prayer, but like many of the images I saw of him, you know, I didn't know what to think of that. Cause I'm like, are you old, bro? Cause most of these pictures of you paintings, you look like you're about to croak. You look like you're about 95 years old and you're about to die. Or some of them, they'd make you look like super effeminate. Like, is that you? Are you like soft? I thought you were like carpenter, bro. Like you, you like swing an ax. Those hands don't look like you've swung an ax too many times. I'm like, I didn't get it. So I'm like, where's the disconnect from the man who helped transform my life and helped me get my manhood back to these paintings where he looks like he's like 95 years old. I mean, I'm like, he was the father of Jesus, not the grandfather of Jesus. I don't get it. And then I discovered that the Catholic church doesn't have a teaching on this, right? These are legends, the age of Joseph. In all likelihood, he was much younger than he's been depicted. Um, Probably not as young as Our Lady, but certainly not, you know, super old. And so many other things that I discovered about him about his virtues, about his greatness and what he did. I mean, he's the whole reason that we have Jesus, right? Our lady brought our Lord into the world by her, yes, but it was Joseph who saved Jesus from a lunatic, from Herod, when he wanted to kill babies, right? And I discovered that saints, blessed, and even popes called Joseph the savior of the savior. Not because Joseph's the Messiah or God, he's not. He'd be the first to tell you that. It's a small S for him, right? But he saved Jesus, Without Joseph, we don't have the bread. And I discovered all this stuff was already prefigured in the Old Testament by another Joseph who went to Egypt and was put in charge of all the granaries. And then at a time of famine, he brought the bread out of Egypt. Wow, right? We got a much greater Joseph who perfected all of that. And we we wouldn't have the Eucharist without Joseph. We wouldn't have Calvary without Joseph. He's the one who got his son and his wife prepared for the sacrifice. And he wouldn't even be there. But without him, it wouldn't have happened. And I'm like, Joseph, do you know how much the world and the church needs you right now? And I didn't get a response, of course. But I know he was like, yes, big time. And I know the Holy Trinity and Our Lady are bringing this right now in a huge way, guys. In a huge way. If I had the time, I'd go through and tell you. But you're going to, I know you guys um, are going to be doing the consecration, right? The next start date starts on Monday. Uh, February 15th. It ends on the solemnity of St. Joseph. Trust me, you are going to learn stuff in this book that is going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. It blew my mind. I mean, I didn't know the majority of the stuff that I discovered. Like, for example, you know, the wedding ring that Joseph gave to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It still exists. It's in Perugia in a reliquary in the cathedral in Italy, about 30 minutes from Assisi mind-blowing stuff about how the family home in Nazareth was transported by angels from the Holy Land to Loretto, Italy, where it still is today. I mean, this is, a, this is unbelievable stuff, right? About all these saints and what they've said about Joseph, about the apparitions he's appeared in. Apparitions? Yeah. Knock Ireland, Joseph was there. Fatima, Portugal, Joseph was there. And several others. Who knew, right? I mean, absolutely incredible stuff. And now we've got his name in, in, in modern times in the Mass. His name was never in the Mass until 1962. So kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you. Finally got it in there. Now it's in all the Eucharistic prayers. We've got beautiful prayers to him, beautiful feast days. And now it's crescendoed with a year of St. Joseph. Do you know how blessed we are in these crazy, insane times to live in a year of St. Joseph? There's never been one before. In the 2020 year history of Christianity, we have never had a year of St. Joseph. We've never even had a Pope Joseph. Think about that. I'm not talking about Joseph Ratzinger. I'm talking about their papal name, right? We've never had a Pope Joseph. We've had John 23 of them. You know, give me a Joseph, right? Maybe we'll get one in the future. Now is the time of Joseph. He's here. And he's going to be coming strong. He is the secret weapon in the spiritual life. When the battle is going strong, 
you un you take that tarp off that secret weapon, you bring it to the battlefield, and you just start firing. That's what we got with St. Joseph. He's the man that God obeys. He's the terror of demons. That's one of his titles in the litany. He's not some weak, soft dude in the background holding a lily. That ain't the cane of an old man. Uh-uh. That's the staff of a spiritual warrior. That is the staff of, he is the father of Marian devotion. He is the first knight of the Immaculata. He is the first one to say, my lady. There is no man more chivalrous than St. Joseph. He's the father of all this stuff. And yet he's been so ignored, so off, set off. He's the best supporting actor in Christianity. Doesn't even say one word, but nothing got done without him. And now the Holy Spirit is shouting to the church and to you in your situation. Whatever you've gone into Chinacolo for, whatever addiction it was, whatever you're, you were suffering from, whatever it is you're going through, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to go to Joseph. He is powerful, my friends. And when you combine that love for him with love for Our Lady, St. Andre Bassett said, when Our, Our Lady and St. Joseph pray together, it is power. And it is. You can be transformed so incredibly through this relationship because he is your loving father and what does a loving father do for his children he fights for them he protects them he covers them he cloaks them he shields them he corrects them right he didn't need to do that for jesus of course but for us he does and he will just like our lady does and so from here on out i want to challenge you to do something and then i'll end and we can get some questions in I know you pray the rosary every day. That's therapy. Brilliant. Sister Elvira, what she did. Brilliant. If the world only knew, right, this method that Chinacolo has. Unbelievable, right, with the rosary, adoration, manual labor. Brilliant method. I wish I had known this back in the day. But now when you pray the joyful mysteries of the rosary, bring in Joseph. Those are Joseph mysteries. Don't leave them out. Meditate upon his place in those mysteries because he's there and he wants you to, 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 to welcome him into your prayer life through the rosary. Okay, my friends, that's my talk. I hope that you get some good fruit from it. Give you some hope, give you some, a message of, of love. And in this year of St. Joseph, don't miss the grace. Take advantage of this man who wants to be a big part of your life, of this father who wants to be a big part of your life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to ask uh, the guys of the community and the girls of the community, if any one of you want to ask a question, just go in front of the camera I ask a question to Father Calloway, uh, and also want to say that uh, in your message, in your experience, in your testimony, uh, we feel like uh, he is home for us, because uh, we all come from the same story, and we all uh, went through the pain, the suffering, or the struggling, or the, you know, the, the rough of our life, but also encountering in your case, you encounter the priest, you, you, you said that uh, your parents, uh, they became providence for you because of their conversion and the little book that you found over there or on, on the stairway or on the dresser. So for us, also the journey in community become providence of our own life. Mm. And that the providence of our own life became the only transformation with the community it became also conversion for many of our families. Mm -hmm. And also the prayers of many of our families, they were also the fruit for us to come to the community. So your story is uh, relate with us in a special way. Mm -hmm. And also the, the St. Joseph, uh, we are very devout. And also with this uh, consecration that some of the guys were, already did it last year, Oh, okay.
And, uh, and so, in this year, we are all gonna do it, and so the families of the community. So we open the consecration, not only for us in community, but also for the families, that, but also there right. are the journey for the family too, you know? It's right. a parallel journey, you know, because we all need to be on the same page and the same level. Yeah. So any of you wanna ask a question or any of the other houses? No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Dai ragazzi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Father. First of all, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your authenticity and honestly just for your joy. It was like a truly beautiful and great experience to hear you. And I just thank you for, you know, showing us that you are just like us and that's so relatable and to see that the, how far we can go is something that's achievable and it's achievable while still being ourselves and having that joy and that yeah. like desire for life. And I just want yeah. to thank you for that. Well, thank you. And something I was thinking about was we all come from the darkness to the light. That's the whole thing with our community. But the more I go from my darkness into my light, I see that the things that I lived or the things that I went through or some of the more difficult things turn out to be some of the most important things in reaching out to others and to like spreading the gift of hope and of faith in like my new part of my life. So if you look back in that darkness of yours, was there something in particular that happened to you or that was true of you that now turns out to be one of your more powerful assets, especially like in evangelization? Right. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, definitely. There's probably a whole bunch of them. Um, but I think it, from my perspective as a guy, right, I definitely grew up um, having that mentality to just score when it came to girls, right? So I, that is a shameful part of my life for sure, because I hurt a lot of people on so many different levels emotionally and in other ways. But now I find in this pornographic, saturated age that we live in um so many people you know they they're like father i'm really struggling with this i'm so sh ashamed and i'm like look okay i understand yes it is sinful but you know what i'm i'm, I'm here for you talk to me it's okay you know we, we can talk it's okay and that is like something great especially for guys right because i mean this is i can't tell you the confessions i hear of course right i get in big trouble but when it comes to the sins of men today this is numero uno i mean this particular lust and so it's really helpful when guys can talk to a priest that's been there on one level and, and is able to identify it. And I don't look at him and think, dude, you're a filthy perv. I'm like, bro, I understand. You can talk to me. You can talk to me. Okay. Be real, be honest. And that's been very helpful in my priestly ministry. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, father. Um, my name is Daniel Pendergrass and, uh, I first, uh, I met you uh, a few times. I was uh, in Stockbridge. I was with uh, Father Gately's Mary Missionaries of Divine Mercy okay. uh, from 2015 to 2017. So okay. um, I remember, you know, being, uh, you know, being there and being so close to, to, to that group, to the Divine Mercy Shrine and meeting you, uh, you know, your, your story was very powerful for me, for me. At the time, I had, you know, had darkness in my past and then I went through a period of sobriety but then I fell again while I was with the missionaries ended up uh, leaving and coming back home and fell even deeper um, and then found out about I found out about this place through uh, Eric Mall oh yeah and uh, he told me uh, we were good friends when I was with the missionaries and I, he knew what was going on with me back home and told me about this place and needless to say I, I you know I felt like Mary was calling me here and I came here and I've been here for a little over three years now um, but, um, yeah, so my question is, um, um, I'm a, I'm a convert as well. I've, uh, I'll be celebrating my seven years this Easter as, as a, as a Catholic. And, uh, when I first became Catholic, I, I, I felt like the Lord was calling me here. I didn't really understand it at the time, but I felt like I would do everything, um, Catholic except Mary. I'm like, oh, you know, some Catholics, if they want to have Mary in their life, that's fine, but yeah. I'm not going to be one of them. Yeah. Um, and needless to say, like, I feel like, I don't know. I just feel like Mary has a real special place in her heart for the broken and people who have lived in darkness in their past. And, mm -hmm. um, I felt like that in, 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 in a very real way in my life. And, 
and she just wasn't going to have it. She was going to have a relationship, and she was going to be my mother one way or another. <laughs> and um, so, um, and I, eventually, it was like she just kept knocking on my heart, knocking on my heart, and I did the consecration. I, I fell in love with her, and mm. I've been in love with Mary ever since. And I feel like she's it for me. You know, she's mm -hmm. she's everything. So, uh, I but at the same time, I feel like I've really struggled with with having a devotion to Saint Joseph. Maybe because I'm, I'm just so in love with Mary that in a way I kind of, I don't know, I don't want to split, you know, that with another devotion. I, right. I, I understand the need for St. Joseph in my life and I pray to him and I have mm -hmm. felt like a real block in there. And I didn't, uh, my question for you is, do you feel like um, doing the consecration to St. Joseph and having a devotion to him, has it helped you to have an even greater love for Mary and helped your relationship to, to become even better with Mary? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's a good point. I mean, because, you know, the a consecration to Mary and a consecration to St. Joseph, it's not meant to be like a competition or anything. And anyway, complimentary, you know, and we know that Mary is greater than Joseph, of course, she's our queen. She's, oh, she's everything to us, right? Um, but I have found in my in my own giving of myself to St. Joseph, that I want to be Joseph, I want to be like him in my relationship with Mary, you know, and uh, there's actually male saints in the past, like St. John Eudes and several others, who have called themselves another Joseph for Mary. And if you think about all forms of Marian consecration, whether it's, you know, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximian Kolbe, the Schoenstatt movement, Kentenek, or the Legion of Mary, Frank Duff, or whatever, all of them, all of them encapsulate in one person, St. Joseph. He's the greatest Marian saint. The, nobody outdoes Joseph and his Marian, you know, love for Our Lady. So I found that myself in getting close to him, I'm becoming actually more pleasing to Mary because who's the one person outside of her divine son, our Lord, of course, that she would want us to be like Joseph, right? And so that's what I strive for. And so, yeah, for me, it has helped tremendously. And here's a, here's a key insight too, how it's helped me in particular. Remember, you know, I, I told you about some of my faults and weaknesses and sins. One of them being, you know, impurity. So Joseph has helped me in unbelievable ways to have a chaste heart, to have that pure intention. And that I get close to Mary. Because remember, Jesus said, you know, the pure of heart will see God. So if, if our hearts aren't pure, we can't see right. But if our hearts are pure, we're going to see God and everything that's of God. And so I feel that I even see Mary better now. I feel that I'm closer to her because I have a Joseph-like heart. And for me, that, that changes everything, right? I want to be you, Joseph. I mean, in a certain sense, I'm like jealous of you, Joseph. You got to be married to her. Really? I mean, that's every man's dream to have the Immaculata, you know, as, as your bride. I mean, you blessed man, right? For me, I'm like, Joseph... I want to be like you. I want to be as close to her as I possibly can. And um, yeah, that's what it's done for me. Thank you, Father. You're welcome, brother. Hello, thank you. Hi. You every, la every lady here is named Maria Goretti. I love it. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, my name is Agape. Okay, that's good. Um, so my question is, uh, I fall into the temptation that because we, we know so little about St. Joseph, that anything we say is just merely speculation. Anytime I hear something, I think, but how can you actually know that? Mm. Do you have any advice as to how to overcome this skepticism towards him? Sure. No, that's great. Yeah. Sounds like you got a little Dominican Thomistic bent there. Um, they're always <laughs> making distinctions like, I don't know about that, right? Um, it's a good point you make because I've had a lot of people ask me that. So it's always important as Catholics to remember that divine revelation for us comes in three forms. So scripture is the first and the primary form. But then we have tradition um, and then we have the magisterium. So they're all three important and necessary so that we don't start making it up on our own. Well, in scripture, yeah, you're right. We don't have much. We have his actions more so than words. We don't have, have any words. But if you unpack tradition, meaning what the Holy Spirit has revealed to the church through the popes, 
through the saints, through the mystics, through the, what religious communities have been founded to have devotion to him, what shrines have been, what wonders, what miracles, and all those kind of things, you can get a pretty good picture that does come from divine revelation. So it's not just Father Calloway making up, winging it, rolling the dice. Hey, you know, no, it's, it's actually what the Holy Spirit is telling um, to the church. And so that's why, like, the book, like, um, I wanted to make sure that I got an imprimatur for the book, which is like this seal of approval, right, by the church. So I got that from my bishop in Steubenville. And it's got cardinals, bishops, great Scott Hahn, tons of theologians have endorsed it, you know. Um, so remember that, those, that threefold understanding of how we get our understanding of truth revealed by Christ, scripture, tradition, magisterium. So all of that, we get a pretty good picture of Joseph. All right, see a guy in yellow coming up. I think it's yellow. His name is Levi. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Yeah, it's Levi. Can you hear me, Father Calloway? Yeah, bro. Hey, uh, I, so I read your book, No Turning Back, and I think it's yeah, I think it's really good, important, especially in the church today in our generation. You know. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, drug addiction, uh, you know, pornography addiction, sex, sexuality, all that crazy stuff out there, and there's a lot of like the youth is. Uh, gripped in that so it's good to have a person like you that's cooperating with God's grace that's radically turned their lives and you can help lead people you know more to Christ I just want to know a little bit more about you know you say in like the book okay, you're going to seminary you know it's very hard for you and stuff like that I think in general it's very hard for all of us because I know God now I've lived a very simple life I was addicted to alcohol crack all the crazy drugs and for so long and I just want to know like I know God now, and every time I fall more, I get, you know, more discouraged because it's like God has given me life, he's given me all this grace, but yet I still, everybody says, oh, yeah, I'm weak, but it's like, okay, I go to confession, when the hours later, I'm sitting again, you know, and I'm like, oh, right, right. I go right back, and I get, it's like, it's a little yeah. pit of going to confession every time, the same stuff over and over and over again, it just gets yeah. me in. So I just want to sure. know, like, what was it like, uh, you know, dealing with discouragement and, like, change your life to come in a priest and when I just come in a better Catholic in town. How do you yeah. deal with that discouragement? Yeah, again, great question. And and trust me, I mean I'm still there in the fight. Trust me. I, I jack it up all the time, right? Um and I think the key is just to know that ha you've been shown truth for a reason. Um that you you know where to go, right? God doesn't want you to sin, sure, right? but he knows that you're broke, you're wounded, you've got things that are gonna take some time. It's very rare that he comes in and heals somebody instantaneously from deep, deep wounds that we're dealing with, right, addictions. So, because a lot of people, they say to me, Father, it seems like you were healed like overnight and you never had, oh no, 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 right? I had a romance with God that I called the honeymoon, right? Where I didn't, I, I didn't fall right for a, a long period of time. But then I did, and I, and I messed up, and, and, you know, still, as I said, I go to confession for stupid things. I make mistakes, you know, even though I got one of these around my neck. I'm not a robot or an angel. I've still, I live in a fallen world. I've got my desire sometimes. I'm like, I got to check myself, or I just mess up. Um, but the key is to know that you're loved, that you have a loving father who, through his son, is saying to you, even if you sin 70 times seven a day, which is endless, as long as you're sorry and you want, you know, to, to be better, okay, just get back up and keep striving, keep striving, because you've got a, a God that you can call dad. He's your dad, right? A loving dad. And he's always going to be there for you, no matter how broke, wounded, how many times you, you, you jack it up and mess it up. Um, I, I, I would be dishonest with you if I said that you're not going to continue to struggle. You are, right? All of you are. But that's part of the process of dying to yourself and, and, and learning to, to love sacrificially. And even if you make a mistake, to run to the Father. Run to the Father, right? I mean, imagine if you did not know this. You'd be lost, probably dead. I know I would be. So... You know, knowing this doesn't make me perfect, although I want to be, but I no longer deny the truth. And there's a big difference between denying the truth and not being able to live it perfectly. 
right? I, I can't live it perfectly. I try, but I mess it up. Like St. Paul, my spirit is like a hero. I think I'm like Bruce Lee in the spiritual life, but then physically, <laughs> I'm like, man, come on. I just went to confession 30 minutes ago, right? I know, brother, right? And I think St. Paul knew this well himself, but don't ever deny the truth. That's the dangerous territory. When you start denying the truth, then you've allowed your sin, you're too comfortable with it, and you're walking towards a cliff. But if you know what you've done is wrong, and you've got that contrition, that's a grace, and your Father is calling you back. Run to the Father. Run to the Father, right? We've got a, such a good Father. And, I, I, you know, that's what helps for me, because I'm still in it with you, brothers and sisters. You know, I haven't crossed that finish line yet. I, I've been a Catholic 25 years now, I think um or 26 i think i still struggle man i still struggle but i got a good father a good good father all right guys i i actually got to get going here because i got another thing coming up i gotta get to so i'm not gonna be able to hang around for much longer maybe like five minutes Father, we want to also give an opportunity to really thank you because uh, uh, your words are also very encouraging for all of us. And we're going to do the novena, and, and also we will pray through St. Joseph. For us, St. Joseph, also, like I said before, is also the prayer to St. Joseph. And we do many novenas to St. Joseph also in divine providence. He's always been a, also the... The one that we were, you know, St. Joseph, thank you, provide for us. And sometimes uh, also the guys, you know, they, they do novenas at night, you know, to St. Joseph when maybe we are short in food or stuff. And then St. Joseph always provide. The community has been around for 37 years. And Mother Vera entrusted the community to God, to St. Joseph, to the Blessed Mother. And we touch it, and we lived it, and we felt it, and we really i've been around the community for 30 years you know so i've been clean for 30 years and in the meantime i can see that uh, everything you said and there's also a struggle nobody's perfect i'm not perfect even if i'm 30 years clean like you said that you are 26 years that you are catholic you know that you follow the sacraments everything so none of us is perfect, but there is always something to go. You know, we can always go to confession. We can always uh, ask forgiveness. We can always uh, pick up ourselves and stand up again, you know, every time we fall. So I want to just say really thank you, thank you, thank you, because uh, I think also for the guys and for the girls in the community, you have in front of you 80, 90 people, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we kind of, uh, we are on a journey. And those, uh, your words inspire us, you know? Thank you. And I'm sure that the, the novena, uh, now that you give us a nice intro, it will give us even more motivation to really follow the novena well, you know? Because uh, some of us uh, are hard, testadura, like we say in Italian, hard-headed. Testadura, really doesn't go in. You know, it yeah. takes a while to get it in, you know? And so your words are really inspiring. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anything? Thank you, my friends. Thank Glad you. I would, I would love to give you a priestly blessing to close. Is that okay? Yeah, ab absolutely. Okay, great. And, and I'm going to give you the blessing. I have a second class relic of St. Joseph. It's a piece of his cloak here, right? Wow. So I will bless you with this, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to pour down your graces and mercies upon all my friends here. Help them as they strive for holiness and virtue, turning away from the darkness, sin, and vice, to be set free by your truth, by your love, by your mercy. We ask this through the powerful intercession of Our Lady, the Queen of Peace, and the great Saint Joseph. And I give this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.